Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brett. Um, welcome to the City of Ann Arbor City Planning Commission working session uh, on October 11th at 7 p.m. So if, well, I think we can call the meeting to order and I think we will move right on to public comment. <clears throat> Any members have, of the public who wish to address the commission, you can do so now for up to three minutes. You can just, you can use the raise hand feature on Zoom if you'd like to address the planning commission. And I don't see anybody called in, so the other instructions don't seem necessary. So does anybody wish to address the planning commission at this time? Seeing none. All right, we will move on. We have <clears throat> we have the comprehensive plan and the planning kickoff today. And so I think um, as you are in the process of uh, promoting those that are presenting, I suppose. Exactly, uh, one moment. Yeah, uh, not a problem. <clears throat> All right, uh, so uh, thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, let me, I'm gonna introduce a couple of members of the team who are here are joining us. We've got a couple other, um, several other members actually of the consultant team who are available should we need expertise, but the primary participants have been promoted. Um, I will do a brief introduction to um, Stacy Chen from Interface Studio, who's the lead planning consultant on the comprehensive plan. And then Oliver Kiley from Smith Group, uh, who uh, is helping with a lot of the community engagement aspects, um, uh, portion of the plan. And then also Kevin Hively, uh, who provides some economic analysis uh, as part of the comp plan process. Um, as part of this, uh, a, a PowerPoint was shared, but nonetheless, even though you were diligent in reading all of those materials in advance, we are still going to go through that PowerPoint with you. Um, but we're going to do our best to um, save uh, the bulk of the time at the conclusion of that for some dialogue, um, some feedback, and some direction from you. Um, with that, I think the only other instruction I'm going to provide is I think that um, the team is, is welcome to, if you want to have a question during the PowerPoint, to go ahead and raise that question. Um, I'm kind of looking at Stacy and Oliver for confirmation if you'd like to do that or if you'd prefer to get through it um, all together. But um, we're... Um... I, I will um, show you the agenda for what we aim to talk about. It's kind of two parts. So we're happy to pause in the middle for um, some questions and then continue on. Awesome. And then I would just ask you, Wanwu, are you, um, as we dive into this, are you okay if um, Stacy and um, Oliver just sort of uh, address any questions that are raised directly, or do you want those to be directed to you? I'll just directly to Stacy and Oliver. Perfect. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Stacy and Oliver, you should uh, have the potential to kick this off. Yep. So take it away. Let me, I'll share my screen. Are we good? Everybody can see? Yeah. Great. So uh, here is what we aim to talk through briefly in this presentation. But as Brett said, we really want to devote the bulk of the time to having a discussion with you. Um, so uh, team introductions, a little bit about the process and our engagement approach. And then we'd like to stop there for clarification questions. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we've heard so far. And that kind of just tees us up for the meat of our discussion. Um, many of us have met you already, um, but I would like to just introduce our team and our roles. So Interface Studio is the lead um, planning and urban design firm, and we will be project managing this project. Um, on the call tonight um, are Maria from our office and also Michaela, um, but you will also see any number of the five of us um, at some point in this project. And then uh, this is the Smith Group team. They are also looking at sustainability um, as well as collaborating with us on the land use planning and then really taking the lead on engagement. They are located 
in Ann Arbor and have done um, many projects in Ann Arbor. Um, and Oliver will also be speaking tonight. And I believe Carolyn may also be on the call tonight. But again, you will see all these uh, team members um, at some point during this project. And Kevin Hively is on the call tonight with Ninograt Partners, and he is looking specifically at economic development um, and housing. And then, um, and Access is on the team with a focus on retail and entrepreneurship. Um, Bobby should be joining the call um, shortly. So should there be any questions after the presentation, he, he should be on the call um, to answer those. Um, I think the Planning Commission knows what a comprehensive plan is, but for the benefit of any public members, um, just a quick, uh, quick little blurb about what is a comprehensive plan and its purpose. Um, it is a document that sets forth a vision for the city's future and its priorities. And it is done with the public, um, with residents and stakeholders over an intensive um, period of conversation, which will take up the, we have like an 18 month process set out. So we'll be going to the public in multiple ways um, to ask their opinion and get their sense of what's important um, to them in, in the, the development of the city over time and what it will result in our um, recommendations for land use, for policy changes, and also uh, spending priorities in the city. Council has already made it very clear that the plan must address these three um, very important values, which are affordability, sustainability, and equity. And so those will be, um, you'll be hearing that a lot over the next 18 months, and it, it will be in every piece of our process um, going forward. Also, Council has very specifically um, talked about these five things. One is making sure that A20 is implemented wherever possible in the land use and development, um, that we look at ways to add housing um, throughout the city and also in single family zoned areas, um, that we look to try to simplify the many zoning districts that exist and make sure that they have flexible um, going forward and adaptable, and then making sure that we emphasize those values that I just uh, discussed and make sure that those are front and center in, in the decision-making over land use. Um, and then finally, that this plan will have recommendations to help repair past harms um, related to land use policies um, that were exclusionary. And now I'd awesome. like to hand it over to Oliver. Awesome, thanks, Stacey. So just a few slides talking about kind of process and some uh, updates on the engagement um, and even some engagement work that's already been happening over the last couple of weeks. Um, so this slide is really just speaking to our overall process. Um, and, you know, Stacy mentioned the values piece is really critical, um, affordability, sustainability, um, and equity, those three pieces. And so you'll see a lot of arrows sort of pointing back up to that. And the key there is that, you know, as we move through this process, you know, we'll be taking time to kind of hone in and clarify and refine what those values really mean. What are the kinds of outcomes that are attached to them that we want to get to at the end of the day? What does that look like? And then as we go through the process, we can always be checking back in. So we're going to be brainstorming lots of different ideas and things that could happen in the future of the city. We can start to then test those ideas back against the values, see whether they're meeting the test or not. And if they're not, we can go back and refine them. Um, and then ultimately those values can be used to help prioritize um, projects, whether that's you know capital spend, spending or policy initiatives and to prioritize those again, based on those values. So everything is to be oriented around those. Next slide. And then, you know, in terms of more of a linear schedule as we look over the next 18 months or so, our work is formally broken down into kind of four big phases of work this kind of getting started phase where we were getting up and running on the project. We're now um, kind of transitioning and doing some inventory and analysis work. And we'll speak to a little bit of that later today. We'll be going through a deeper visioning and strategy session, and then ultimately putting the plan together, uh, the plan documents together themselves. 
I think key to this is that the lower section there is just a sampling of some of the engagement items that are planned over the course of this 18 month process. Um, the point there being that, you know, engagement is an ongoing effort. It's not something that we're going to do with just a couple of points and then drop and, you know, pull it in. It's going to be an iterative ongoing conversation with the community, with leadership, with stakeholders, with residents um, throughout this process to vet these ideas and test things and bring them back to the public and make sure that they're really living up to the values that we're working with. And um, we did send as part of, I think the attached materials for this session, there was a draft engagement plan that was also accompanying this presentation document. Um, that is gonna be a living document that we use over the course of the project that will lay out you know, everything from communication strategies and how we're reaching out and who and by what methods all the way down to what are the specific kind of engagement tasks that we're um, anticipating doing, who are we trying to target and reach out, um, who do we need to hear from at each step in the process. And so this, this diagram is somewhat of a distillation of all of that into one format where it's just saying, you know, there's lots of different ways that we need to engage stakeholders. That's going to vary depending on the kind of commitment and the level of involvement different people may want to have in the process. You know, all the way at the right hand of the uh, of the board is our steering committee, which um, we're working to get assembled for this project. There'll be a neighborhood outreach team that'll also be hired, um, paid participants to help do public engagement and kind of uh, engage their communities more deliberately. So groups like that will be intimately involved throughout the process with a pretty high level of engagement and a lot of interaction. But we want to create those opportunities at the other end for somebody that maybe they just have 10 minutes or 15 minutes and they want to be able to share their idea quickly and make sure that a thought that they had or a suggestion that they had got into the process. And we want to make sure that we're providing that full range um, and everything in between. We can do the next slide. So to that point, um, over the past month or so, um, kind of towards the end of August and throughout September, our whole team has been involved in doing lots of interviews. We've started these off uh, really interviewing um, a range of folks across the community that are generally in more leadership uh, positions. So we've interviewed council members, the mayor, we've interviewed um, department and city unit heads for just about every corner of the city that you can imagine. Um, and really starting this process off to just understand at a high level, like, you know, what's working well, what's not working? What are the friction points? What are some of the flashpoint issues that um, council members or commission members are having to grapple with and deal with? You know, we wanted to give everybody a chance to just air that and um, uh, in a small group setting and a small conversation setting so that we can get that frank, honest discussion kind of starting off and going into this process. And as we switch to some of the other content later on, we've started to synthesize a lot of the things that we're hearing, a lot of the common themes, common trends that we're hearing across these interviews, and that's starting to inform the process. And we'll be speaking more to that in a few minutes. Next slide. A few other things just to note, if you're talking with uh, constituents or for anyone in the public who's watching, there is a public website um, that's up and running. And I've just completely blanked on the name of what the website link is. It should be right front and center here. If you go to the uh, comp plan uh, website on this or through the city's website and search for comprehensive plan or the planning department, there's a link front and center to this dedicated page um, for the city's or for this comprehensive plan website. This will be listing, you know, all of our engagement activities. There's some baseline information that's on there about the plan and the process. There's a project blog on there and we're gonna be periodically posting kind of thought pieces or things to kind of get the conversation moving locally that people can share you know, across social media platforms. There's one article in there that's already kind of setting the stage for some of this conversation that uh, we'll be having tonight. So that's up and running. Next slide. And you know, we mentioned that the engagement work you know, beyond the stakeholder uh, interviews that we've had has already kicked off. So there were two events um, to date that connected to the comprehensive plan. Um, the first couple weeks back uh, was a, a U of M initiated uh, house party, which was a week long series of different kinds of events um, that were held um, 
and there was a number of activities that had focused kind of specifically on asking people questions about Ann Arbor and the comprehensive plan and what it might be able to do for the city and what people's kind of aspirations are. And um, there were some questions in there around housing and affordability and how do we, um, you know, what are the issues that people are grappling with? Um, and then I think a week after that was the city's green fair. And so um, Brett and his team and some members of our team were out um, during the green fair event. We had a big giant uh, chalkboard up and we're just getting input from people on, you know, hey, what are the issues that are important to you? What's critical? And it was really nice because people could come by and we were encouraging them to, you know, if they saw something they liked or didn't like, you know, they could put little tally marks or check marks next to things too to say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Or yeah, I also have that concern. So it was a nice way of just starting to crowdsource the conversation and get things moving. So um, with that, that was a just quick run through on kind of overall timeline, overall process. There's obviously, you know, lots of detail in the scope um, for this scope of work. Um, the engagement plan was shared. Um, just wanted to see, if, I guess, at this point, before we shift into some of the heavier discussion topics, um, whether you had any clarifying questions or things you wanted to ask of us, or if not, we can keep rolling. We don't have too many more slides. And just uh, to maybe provide a little space in case a uh, question percolates, I want to just remind the Planning Commission and for those watching, just roles and responsibilities. So the Planning Commission is the entity who's responsible for drafting and creating the comprehensive plan. Um, so it is your product, it's your rolling up the sleeves and putting and ultimately uh, creating, editing and approving that document. And then you forward that document to the city council. The city council then gives it an up or down vote. Yes, this is reflective of what we want, or it's not quite there. That's not an edit function, but but it can have that effect because if the council for some reason were to say like, oh, I, I think we missed the mark on this, that's gonna be a direction back to the planning commission to go back to the drawing board or to refine or to adjust something in response to that. So I just wanted to set the stage to make it clear. Um, the planning commission is ultimately the author and creator of this document and the city council ultimately adopts it. Commissioner Abrams. Thank you. Um, so this is probably a question for you, Mr. Leonard, but also for um, Oliver and Cece. I'm wondering about uh, where, I guess relative to what you were just saying, Brett, like where the commission role is in that timeline relative to public engagement um, and the stages of the process. And maybe just like generally speaking, not specifically like how often we will see you and um, what kind of opportunities there will be for us to work with you. Like, is this the format or are there other? Yeah, there'll be a there'll be a variety of checkpoints. To be honest, I don't know the exact number of those, but we are gonna have some sort of milestone checkpoints, both with the planning commission and with the city council at a couple of points along the way. Um, with that, um, there could potentially be some additional conversations with the planning commission, um, or it could be with the comprehensive plan steering committee. Um, you may recall that we've done some schedule adjustments with the ordinance revisions committee. And part of that is frankly opening up some space so that if we want some more frequent touch points with a subset of the planning commission, we can have that conversation. But, um, so that's, that's the short of it is there will be multiple touch points. Um, you will, of course, be kept apprised of all the public engagements, but there also be, will be some meetings potentially in this kind of forum, potentially like in-person forum coming to a, a regular planning commission meeting um, where we, that might be the time where we're saying like, okay, we feel like we've really got these values defined and organized in, in, in the manner that we're going to we're going to rely upon them. So that might be an example of a time where we might come to the planning commission for more of an action or an endorsement, if you will, than just sort of an open feedback session like this. Okay. Stacy, uh, Oliver, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I would agree with that. I think it's it's finding those milestones where we really want your feedback. Um, so things like the values, um, our analysis, 
you know, mm-hmm. once that is is ready to go for to make sure, um, do a gut check that that makes sense. Um, and then to provide, um, you know, at major after major portions of the engagement to provide that summary so you can kind of like coming along with us like this is what we're hearing you know and then that's going to shape the next phase of engagement Commissioner Hammerschmidt thank you uh just to follow up on that and then one of the first things you said uh Mr. Lunder about how this process goes um so that we checkpoints with the whole commission at some point checkpoints with city council will we ever like as a commission meet together with city council i'm, I'm just envisioning this like process where it's like we write this plan and like there's feedback and then it, we pass it and then it goes to city council and they're like no like are there going to be opportunities for us to all sort of like discuss together or is it going to be more of like a the team talks to city council here's their feedback like how are you envisioning that to go if you are envisioning anything yet um well, the short of it is we could we could do joint meeting, a joint meeting, if we found that to be helpful. I, I frankly haven't gotten that far yet. And I I guess I wanna be I wanna be respectful of the roles and responsibility. I mean, it's the planning commission's role to create this document and deliver it with a recommendation to the city council. Um, you can you as this board can embrace that partnership to the extent you you wish. Um, but city councils also tasked you with doing this work. So um, it, it's definitely possible. I haven't, I haven't thought of it that specifically yet, but that's something we could explore. I would just say, let's keep that out there as an idea. And as we start getting to that point, if we think that there's going to be some benefit in sort of coalescing and having some of those discussions prior to finalization of that, that's definitely something we could set up. Yeah, I think it, I don't think this has to happen anytime soon. I think it would just sort of be like as it goes along, like if there is an opportunity, if there's something that we feel is contentious, isn't really the right word, but that it might, and you know, yeah. Commissioner Dish, like you will be very helpful with this, but you know, like if there's something that we feel like we do need to have a conversation so that it's not like city council throws it back to us to do more work again so that we're not, you know, like that yeah. might be beneficial. Oh, I agree. Um, and, and if I can just add one quick clarification on that, or not clarification, but, um, you know, I think there'll be, you know, there'll be some points during the process where there's some big moves or some big ideas that we're all kind of collectively putting on the table that um, will be kind of moments that we're all going to need to get buy in on if that's the direction that we want to go with. And I think some of those times, you know, we'll know when they're coming as we get into the process. And I think those will be moments to figure out how that, that collaboration needs to happen because we want to make sure, you know, it, to Brett's point about, you know, it's your responsibility to put it together, but council has to approve it. You know, we don't want them to be blindsided or caught, you know, not be fully aware of what it is that's coming their way during the process. So, yeah. And to, uh, to add to that a bit, um, it does say in the communication plan that there's going to be three touch points under task 1.9. So um, there's supposed to be three big meetings between the uh, commission, I think, and council. So uh, just a quick clarification and then uh, council member Dish. <clears throat> Got your uh, hand up. Uh, you... Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were calling on me or asking. Oh, oh no, no, no. Um... Okay. Yes. I, yeah. I noticed the same thing that you noticed, Chair Wu. Wan Wu. Wait, Chair Lee. I should be calling you. <laughs> you can call me Wu. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I'll call you anything. <laughs> so, yeah, I noticed that the touch points one, two, and three looked like they were, one of them is worded explicitly that it would be a joint meeting with the commission and council. Um, the, the touch points two and three say the core team will meet with the commission and council. Um, this session will be a virtual. It's it sounds like these are all three joint meetings because it refers just to one session. And so um it looks like joint meetings are planned. But I wondered if you could help me understand where on the slide that we're looking at right now that has this very helpful um timeline, where you think those touch points will be falling. They are described as coming after initial data gathering and public input, then second round of public input. So I'm I'm wondering where um is it sort yeah. of yeah. Yeah, I can I can speak to that a little bit too. Um 
you know, I think we're kind of switching from, you know, as where our team is getting up to speed, getting into the analysis and inventory process. I think there's a lot of findings that are going to come out of that process that, again, we want to make sure that we're all agreeing on the basis of data of what's out there today, kind of the validity of the analyses that we're doing. Um, so I think, you know, early next year, if I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, Stacy. so like early winter, next year, February, March timeframe, something like that would be one of those touch points where a lot of the inventory and analysis work is going to be, you know, organized, synthesized into something, you know, into a body of work that we can all kind of validate and vet and review. So that may be one time, so early next year to come together with commission and council and have that alignment. Um, and then as we get into uh, next, later in the summer, next summer is kind of wrapping up a lot of the vision and strategy phase, where again, we'll have essentially the bones of a set of recommendations about what are the kinds of things that we want to move forward with as big ideas. And that can be another time frame to come together and to talk about that. Um, and then the months following that, you know, fall and winter would be kind of putting a lot of the plan documentation together, ironing out a lot of the details. So there'd be another touch point, you know, in that phase somewhere. So essentially, you know, a major touch point in each of the three phases outside of getting started. If that makes sense. I, I think that does make sense. And to add on to that as well, I think if you look at page eight and nine, they do have a more specific Gantt chart that's kind of broken out. <clears throat> so, um, but yeah, those, those are kind of, and actually it does look like this meeting was actually supposed to be joint, but um, you know, perhaps uh, as it's more fleshed out, we can certainly uh, make that and schedule that. But, uh, and then council member Dish, uh, did you have any kind of other follow-up or question? <clears throat> I just, yeah, just one thing I want to add to this too. I, I want, I, I want to be, um, we have a plan. I appreciate that, you know, we're talking about a lot of the, the milestones that are in that proposal and the like, but I, I, I just, I don't want to lose sight of, there is not so much a rigidity to that, that we can't adapt if we find that we need to we find different different approaches or a different frequency or what or that and and honestly easy for me to say it might have consequences for the consultant team and how we adjust scope and the like but i expect we're going to be making some adjustments in community engagement i think part of you know once that steering committee is set for example it's one of the points we're going to we're going to have a conversation with them and say did we hear from everybody we wanted to hear from and unless if they say anything other than yeah, you did perfectly. I don't see any opportunity for improvement. We're probably going to be trying to figure out what's the best way to respond to that. So, so I just want to I just want to make sure that this is a long process. Um, its root, its foundation is a lot of this public dialogue, and I think the team has done a great job. And part of the reason we selected them is the framework that they've put in place. But I don't want you to see that as so rigid that if you, as the planning commission, see a gap or a different approach that you'd like us to explore, that's a conversation for you to bring up with me and we'll figure out what we can accomplish. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Leonard. And do we have anybody else that have any questions at this point in time? I don't see any. <clears throat> um, yeah, and then if you guys wanna keep going, thank you. All right. So um, we'd like to just tee up some of what we've heard. Um, we've heard a lot of things. So we're gonna kind of make this a little bit narrow, but just as a way for us to get into some um, conversation. So I think one of the biggest issues on the table is affordability. Um, we've created a little series of comments to try to illustrate the point, but you know, it, it's becoming unaffordable for the next generation, right? Um, we have, we are still doing our data analysis. We pulled a couple of data points, you know, over half of the renters are considered rent burdened. That means they spend 30% of their income on rent. Um, that's usually an indicator that we look at, um, as, as a measure of affordability. And another, another one is that 77% of Ann Arbor area residents are priced out, right, from, from home ownership. Um, so those are some data points that, 
helped illuminate that issue. Another affordability piece is that a lot of workers can't afford to live in the city. Um, so that is adding to congestion and carbon emissions, right, with people commuting into the city. Um, the data we have pulled is from pre-pandemic times, which is 86,000 people commuting into Ann Arbor. We don't have the most up-to-date numbers, but we do believe that we are still looking at a very high number of people who are commuting into the city for work. And also there's a significant portion of people commuting out of the city for work as well. So those are all folks on the road. Um, I'm sure you've experienced a little bit of this. And then there's also somewhat of a mismatch between the types of housing that people want or need um, and their access to walkable amenities, right? So you have um, like family sized options in neighborhoods that most likely you'll need to drive almost everywhere. Um, and then conversely, you'll have downtown, super walkable, um, but maybe not the kinds of housing options that you need um, as your family grows. So one of the questions is, is there, is there a way to meet in the middle? Can we find opportunities to increase both the housing options and also the walkability of various neighborhoods around the city? So to illustrate the point, um, we are using the goal of housing density, right? So kind of this whole conversation right now is, is around affordability, housing density, and how it's really a complex and interconnected um, set of benefit and challenges, right? To meet any of the goals that we are, we are attempting to achieve. And so when we have this goal of increasing housing den density um, in terms of contributions to affordability, it creates more supply, right? it adds to the affordable housing millage, um, and those all help. In terms of sustainability, it, it can help to reduce carbon emissions if we have a reduction in our commuter traffic, right? So those 80 some, 90 some thousand people who are commuting in, many of them by car. Um, and in terms of equity, it creates more housing in all neighborhoods as a goal. That also increases density, density which could then lead to transportation improvements. And then also, of course, more tax revenue, which goes into services um, throughout the city as well. So there are lots of benefits, but also it's it's more than just changing the zoning, right? So you need a lot of supportive infrastructure in order to achieve this goal as well. So the first step is, yes, you know, we're going to work on this plan and talk about land use and talk about zoning changes. But all of this additional um, infrastructure is also needed in order to achieve this goal. And then there's also trade-offs. And this is just an illustrative example. It's not real in any way, but just to say, look, what if we are, you know, we are just looking at these four things. In all reality, it's more complex and there's lots of other poles, right, to this, uh, to this potential diagram. But say we're trying to say, okay, you know, we want like, you know, our reduction in vehicle miles traveled. We want um, carbon neutrality. We want to make sure we're looking at, you know, sustainability in floodplains and floodplains and also, you know, maximize our affordable housing millage. If we try to pool each of those to like 100%, maximize all of it, that'd be great, right? But in this scenario, it pushes it from being developable to cost prohibitive. And then we get zero, we get zero things built, right? So where is there room for trade-offs is one of the things that we're gonna have this conversation about, right? So maybe we can't have 100% of everything, but can we get to a point where we feel like we have some good items that ultimately help us to create a situation where we're creating more housing, adding to the tax revenue, adding to the affordable housing millage, reducing some of the carbon emissions, you know, where is that balance? I mean, I think that's one of the major things that we want to be teasing out um, in this conversation around housing density, which happens to be a location where a lot of different aspects of the plan are going to be all tangled up together, right? Because we're going to be looking at transportation. Also, we'll be looking at economic development. We're looking at um, walkable neighborhoods and what kind of amenities can there be? So that kind of like really is a big ball of, of lots of complex issues all, all wrapped up into one. Um, so this is our way of kind of teeing off the conversation. And really now we wanna just open it up 
to the Planning Commission to help us think through um, some of these questions. I think, you know, we're also really happy to uh, think about or talk through some of the top issues on your mind, but just to get a sense of like, are these key issues that we've gone over um, resonating? Um, what do these values mean to you? That's one of the questions that was asked at the Green Fair and that we are hoping to ask throughout this process as we as we lead up to our first series of larger public events. So we have some meat to work with. Um, and then just like, what are your, what are your goals and priorities for this comprehensive plan? What do you want this comprehensive plan to do? So I would like to open it up for uh, questions and discussion. Right, thank, thank you so much, uh, Stacey. Um, really appreciate that. And uh, do you wanna take it a, one question at a time or just basically kind of dive in. It might be more structured if we just tackle one question. That, that's my take. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, well, with number one, uh, does anybody want to kick us off? Uh, otherwise I did prep some, at least my, organize my thoughts. So. Um, could we take the slides down so we could see each other a little yes, bit? Yes, absolutely. And thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> Great. Would anyone like to kick us off with key um, issues and whether they resonate? Um, you know, we talked about affordability and sustainability and equity. Somebody like to kick us off? Commissioner Clark. Hey there. Yeah, so um, thanks for doing this work. It looks like we're off to a good start. Um, I wanted to just add um, to the equity component, if there's been any consideration or if there's any way to integrate conversations of resiliency um, and what like it might look like to consider a resilient future for city as we undergo climate change and mitigating impacts for people that might be most vulnerable. Um, uh, so things like shocks, stresses on the infrastructure of the city, how might it impact different people and what kind of things can we maybe incorporate into planning in the future to make sure that the people that are the most at risk, vulnerable um, to front line, you know, on the front lines of these issues aren't gonna be impacted. So I guess I don't have the answers to any of that. It was just something, I guess I was just curious if we could integrate um, some resiliency conversation. Yes, is the short answer. Um, I think that that will definitely be as we start unpacking those very big words of affordability, equity, and um, sustainability, that will be an example of how it actually meets the ground, right? And which neighborhoods, and that'll be part of our analysis, right? Are looking at a lot of indicators across the city um, and trying to identify those neighborhoods that are most in need. And I'll just mention, you know, part of our team at Smith Group, we have a kind of a group out in our Pittsburgh office that focuses pretty much exclusively on sustainability and resiliency related kind of planning efforts. Um, you know, just for example, you know, we had done a lot of the resiliency planning out in Las Vegas, which totally different context and space, but a lot of issues around, you know, water availability and water security, which is pretty important. So um, definitely front and center in our, in our mind, um, you know, it's kind of the flip side of the sustainability coin. Like, yes, we want to bring carbon down, but there's also the reality, like climate impacts are happening already now, and we need to be planning for it through our policies and making sure that, you know, infrastructure investments that we make building projects, development projects that we approve, you know, are supporting the, you know, the physical resiliency of the community. So absolutely. And just to add on like things like resiliency hubs and making sure that not just like neighborhoods, but also populations that might be in the city and vulnerable that aren't captured mm -hmm. with like in the neighborhoods, people that are unhoused, et cetera. And um, yeah, thanks. That's great. Yep. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Um, Commissioner Weatherby. All right, so I'm not sure where in these key questions this these fit, but I'll I'll throw them out here just as sort of big topics. Um, one is the kind of elephant in the room, which is interaction with the university. And I just got back from a 
you know, vision 2034 and planning 2050 uh, kickoff that the university is doing. And there was very little mention of the city. And I don't see a lot of mention of the university. I, I know that you've talked to people, but mention of the university in, and that's that's always been a, sometimes it's a contentious relationship. Sometimes it's just not a relationship. Sometimes it's a good relationship, but sort of, uh, there are two fairly comprehensive planning initiatives going on at the same time in a lot of the same space, um, and some of it literally the same space. So, kind of, how do we, how do we deal with that? Whether it's just acknowledge it and move on, or actually really work to to bring it together. So that's one question I have. Um, and then the other one that I thought was really important and is the housing mismatch, because I think that is something that the the housing that we're building now, which is great, but downtown it's all apartments and it's apartments at this point geared towards students. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, when I talk to people, they're like, well, yeah, I want to live downtown, but not in an apartment. Like, well, <laughs> you know. Either, I mean, some of it's going to have to be kind of a, a rethinking, but also what we are building doesn't match how people think of how they want to live. And, and I think students are like, oh, I don't want to live out in the country because it'll take me too long or, you know, out on the outskirts, even if it's just a 10 minute bus ride or so I think some of that is kind of the housing mismatch and I like that phrase a lot because I thought that was a good a good way of putting it that it it's not just sometimes it's it's just not the match people are looking for and how do we work around that or or work so that people can imagine living in an apartment or multifamily housing so those are my those were kind of my two thoughts just to start with great thank you um, Stacy, if you want to respond to that one. Um, the University of Michigan question, I, I think maybe Brad is reconnecting and maybe best position to answer. I mean, we are happy to be as involved as they will let us <laughs> in, in their um, work. But through our interviews, we've certainly heard a lot about the history of the relationship and it, it yeah like you said it goes through good times and less good times and sometimes it's a better working relationship i mean i'll let brett speak to this but i you know we are happy to take what we can get um in terms of any kind of information sharing or or um, discussion that could happen with the university of michigan yeah i i think it uh, um I honestly think that there has been a history of sort of separate parallel functioning. And I think, um, and I don't, that is not devoid of collaboration. It's not devoid of partnership, but I, I think it's fair that we haven't collaborated a lot on setting big policy goals or sort of certainly big land use goals. And there's some real there's some real reasons for that on sort of missions of the two agencies and the like. I will say that I honestly don't see a ton of opportunity for collapsing the processes, but I see more opportunity for collaboration and partnership and sharing than I probably have seen in my time here. Um, as part of this process, we have sat down with them. They shared with us those the, the, those meetings that are ongoing as well. Um, we, we've talked about some opportunities for um, public outreach where we can share, look for some some opportunities that where we might be able to share that. I don't know that it'll work out from a timing perspective, frankly, where where those plans are. They are a little bit off cycle from each other, but generally happening within the same time period. Um, I would say that we have, and we we have a really positive relationship a good relationship i can say that i can always i have 
great colleagues and partners at the university that we can reach out and explore planning issues. But I, and so I, I would just say that I think that there's more opportunity for shared collaboration, but I, I want to be real. I don't, I don't envision these processes being integrated. Um, and I, that might be a laudable goal, but I think we'll probably have enough work on our hands to get to the policies and trade-offs that is important for our side of that equation as it is. And Maybe like maybe down the road there is more opportunity. Maybe if that is identified it as a goal, um, I would all I can say is that I think that the partnerships there are um, they're welcome and open. I think reason, but uh, honestly, I think that's a little short of full integration of these planning mm -hmm. efforts. Yeah, and I think you know one. If I can add one other thing to you know, given the timing, I you know I believe you know. They're just now kind of rolling out some draft documents and recommendations out of their planning effort, and that's due to wrap up relatively soon. Um, certainly, you know, before we get too much further into the process. So, you know, while the processes aren't, you know, aligned and integrated, and as Brett was mentioning, we do get to have a little bit of a sense of like, here's what their long range plan is. Now, how do we take that information and respond to it? and incorporate it and be able to plan around what some of their interests are so that we can be aware of that. I think that'll be helpful to have on hand as we move forward in our process. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of obvious, obviously mutual benefit that comes between the city and the U of M, um, but there's a lot of, you know, they own a lot of land in the city, right? And that does, and we're studying, you know, and looking at land use across the whole city. And we need to understand how those two sort of energies and forces are meeting and where they can be, you know, brought into alignment. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I could also add a little bit. Um, I, I did actually think of also U of M integration that their, their plan to be an important part. We do share, I think, values of, um, education, meaningful relationship building, built environment, access, growth. Um, I think there's a lot of these sh shared values and I think they can help definitely inform. From our standpoint, um, I think building mass kind of like continuity from you know what the university does, right? They, they build these giant, beautiful looking buildings and seeing how it um, helps to inform land use around that. Um, and, and being able to at least point to that um, will be important. So having their master plan inform ours, uh, I'd love there to be more dialogue. Uh, and I do think that it's important for integration, maybe the next <laughs> iteration. But uh, you're, uh, Oliver, I think, as you said, um, they are kind of from a timing standpoint. We're, we're a little behind them uh, right now. So I think uh, as long as it can help to inform what we want to see around kind of like campus. And, to the extent we do have like what well, uh, C2B and, and a few of other like college campus esque zones. So, um, how to better understand, you know, flexibility uh, again based on those shared values with the college of again, they want education, they want growth, they want, and they also want their students to have uh, a great experience. So, but I do think that you are absolutely right that uh, the two are kind of really should be integrated to a certain extent. So, um, great, great points uh, with respect to planning integration and the downtown housing mix. I didn't want to necessarily not talk about the housing mismatch. Um, so if, did, if anybody wanted to kind of respond to uh, Commissioner Weatherby's uh, comments with respect to housing mix as a potential value. And if not, that's okay too. I think it's something that we have observed, but we still need to do our um, research to really dive deep into the data um, and see what's going on. Um, so one of the things we're looking at, and to your point, is trying to see if we can get not just units, but bedroom counts, you know, to get a real, like, more granular look at, at what the housing looks like. Thank you. Council Member Dish. Thank you. So, yeah, I wanted to say, uh, I was glad that you brought up mismatch. Um, but I feel really challenged by that observation. I mean, it's an observation, I think, that 
I, I'm glad you codified it. I think it's something that we notice. Um, I mean, what would it take to have family-sized options downtown that are also home ownership options? So would that be mid-priced condos downtown? And are there any levers available to us to produce that? I don't know that it's in our control. Um, multifamily in our conversations and and on the ground has been synonymous with rental largely. Um, and then of course there are the few pockets of high-end condos that have been developed downtown and on North Main and Ashley, you know, a couple of other areas. So that's clearly not that doesn't help any matching because <laughs> it just replicates the downtown dynamic. Um, when I was talking with a lot of residents a few years ago running, um, economic diversity is a concern. It's one of the things that people feel Ann Arbor is losing and that is changing the character of Ann Arbor. And so, and I think that I take them to mean economic diversity across the city as a whole, but also in key areas. I mean, so if not downtown, if we're gonna give up on downtown, if that's what we would have to do, I'm not saying that we should, I'm just saying, I don't know what will come out of our discussions of that. Uh, but if not downtown, um, which of the transit corridors would be best to promote economic diversity and offer options, not only of rental, but also of ownership in a multifamily format, in a denser format. Um, we hear a lot that my kid can't afford to buy a house here. And oh. I feel like, yep. And that's, there's no way we can bring that model back. We don't have the land for that. We can't make it possible for everyone who wants to live in Ann Arbor to have a single family home. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so I'm I'm feeling like you're identifying conundrums or conundra. I don't even know if that's a word, but, um, and I was also very struck by your saying, it is more than just chaining, changing the zoning. You need a lot of supportive infrastructure in order to achieve these goals. And this is the comprehensive land use plan, so. <laughs> I think it's great for it to call attention to the things that are outside the purview of land use and zoning that we need to achieve our goals. I think that's key because otherwise we'll be blamed for not achieving our goals through the leverage that we have. But so those are my um, just reactions. I wanted to underscore economic diversity and I wanted to underscore this issue of ownership options, a different model of ownership. Yeah, partially a response to that and partially just like a note for um, the team and I. There has been some communities that I know have explored how to how to cultivate a more family friendly downtown housing typology. Um, I don't I don't profess to be an expert at it, but it but my recollection is that it is thinking about amenities that would be really important to families versus maybe a young professional. You know, we tend to get a lot of apartment buildings with pool decks um, and TV rooms. What if there was some aspiration that once you got to a certain development, it, it would have a playground or it would have um, uh, an incentive for childcare centers. So, um, Again, half of a response to that question, but a note for us and the for me and the team, maybe we could explore some of those models to see if there's any yeah. um, things that could be pulled into. Particularly, I think it's particularly relevant in our downtown zoning, but maybe it'll help start to foster some other ideas about ways that we can foster that along transit corridors and the like as well. Yeah, and I just want to underscore um, what was the comment um, that Commissioner Dish had shared about just the affordability on the ownership side, not just the rent side, because in, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, displacement and equity and things like that, I mean, the wealth building side of it needs to be thought through and how do we put those mechanisms in place so that 
people can get ownership and are not not necessarily, you know, stuck in a rental um, cycle that, you know, they have, they don't people don't have a lot of a lot of levers uh, when rents keep getting jacked up and up and up, right? So, thinking through that side of it um, and the policy tools that'll be um, that we can bring to bear through this process, I think will be really key in how we can connect those policy tools with our land use planning will be really critical. So just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Thank you. Stacey, I don't know if um, I'm, ha I don't know if you, we want to keep going through the questions. Is, is it, would it be helpful just to sort of flash up the questions again about. Um... Sure. I can do that. Um, I am also just, you know, beyond the questions, just very keen to know what is top of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why, as part of my intention here, I just want to make sure that um, people aren't feeling sort of restricted. Like if if you want to address any of these questions, um, I to the extent we can touch on as many of them as, as possible, but really, um, as indicated, we want to wanted to foster this time for whatever is on your mind. What are your questions? What are your fears? What are your concerns about this process going forward? Sure. Thanks, um, Stacey. Yeah, thank you for putting this back up. Uh, Council Member Dish, did you want to finish up the thought? Uh, please continue. This is another thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> since, we were, since we were allowed to move. Um, I, I appreciate, Oliver, you um, articulating what I said as, as a way of saying what affordability means to me, That's that was very helpful. And so I wanted to say that um, one of the things I've also heard from residents is that that um, sustainability definitely means resilience in the way that Oliver was talking about. I also think that equity means resilience in the way that Sadira was talking about. Um, I think the sustainability to our residents also means stewarding our assets, our parkland, the river, and other natural features. Um, so I'm just, and this again, I'm I'm actually trying to reflect to you things that I hear. I'm not trying to take a stand on the priorities. I'm just trying to reflect what I hear. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Abrams. Hi, thank you. Um, I have like a, a collection of random thoughts in no particular order that may not answer the questions, but maybe I could just get them out there and then we could take them up or not take them up. But um, so one thought I had was just, I was wondering if if part of the process, I've never been through a comprehensive plan process uh, as a commissioner. So, or, or I think many of us probably haven't, but so there might be things that I'm wondering about that are outside the scope of what this process will yield, but I'm wondering whether the process will give us any information, will give us like uh, targets in terms of housing. I think we often feel that we understand that we have a housing shortage, but I don't know that we have any data about exactly how much housing we would need to build over what period of time and what kind of housing that should be in order to meet demand. And I think there are a lot of debates in the community about the relative merits of uh, building, you know, technically affordable housing at a certain AMI or below. Uh, and also, or but, or instead, um, you know, thinking about just more housing being better and, and overall mm -hmm. being able to bring the cost of housing down. And so I think it would help us, but also our residents, if we just had more information about how the plan might think about those two different approaches and also some kind of you know, give the city some metrics or or targets to hit. Um, like I know that um, housing commission, of course, has knows exactly how many units of affordable housing they would want to build, um, and how far behind we are that goal. But I don't think we, as a city, have that for market rate housing or privately developed housing. Um, I have a bunch of things. I don't know if I should just kind yeah. of go one by should one. I, maybe we go. Should we do? In. Yeah. Uh, um. I Stacey, yeah, if you want to respond to that one. Uh, yeah, so quick. It's fresh. I, I think that is a great question. And I think that's something that we're going to be working out with 
you and with the community because there's no one answer. It's 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 go back to the trade-offs question because um, you're not going to build all the housing you need. It's technically impossible, right? Uh, so we have to figure out where do we want to land. Um, and part of this on our on our piece will be as we're going through our research to come up with some education. We're thinking of like educational pieces where we can provide examples. You know, um, this is your situation now. This is, you know, the deficit, let's say. This is how other communities are doing. You know, there's no like, you know, magic answer, but we need to talk as a community as to what proportion, say, of the commuters, you know, like the 90,000 people do we think could potentially be housed, you know, here? And then there's the other portion of the conversation about the difference just between let's build, let's build, let's build, and let's focus on affordable housing. We need to, because we need to build market rate housing to get the millage to fund the affordable housing, right? Because they are connected. So we'll have, we, I think there's a whole educational piece that we'll be working on as we do our research. And I think that what Stacy said is, you know, there's going to be some tough big picture numbers to start to grapple with, you know, metrics or targets, as you said, right? You know, what percentage of the people that are commuting here, you know, to to meet some of our, you know, aspirations for being a more inclusive community, you know, what percentage of those people would want to live in Ann Arbor if they could find a place that was affordable for them to live here? Um and it's not just the, you know, the workers, it's their whole families, right? So then it cascades into, okay, well, you know, there's going to be kids or, you know, can the school system handle it? You know, all of those sort of infrastructure questions start to come into play too. And those are all some of those kind of, you almost need to look, start to look at those big numbers. And then we can start to say, okay, like, here's some big numbers that we're working towards. Step two is like, okay, now how do we actually fit that into the fabric of the city? Does it all go in a couple of pockets? Does it get distributed around? You know, what are the sort of scenarios and approaches that are going to work to help us sort of meet that target? And there's those are all going to have their own pros and cons and trade-offs that we'll need to grapple with and work through too. Can I just pose a question? So you, you referenced, we have the 2015 housing affordability study, which is really focused at 60% AMI and below. Commissioner Abrams, I'm interpreting the question as you think that that would be helpful to have some sort of market rate targets in our plan. Is Am I interpreting that correctly? And does do the other commissioners sort of agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think we need to be too, I don't want to pin us down too rigidly. I mean, I think it, I understand that this is a system of trade-offs. There's no magic bullet. Um, so I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying like, oh, I think we need to write into the plan that like, you know, okay. this is the target and that we need to check it every year, but I think it would be interest, it would be useful information. And maybe I would defer to people with more expertise in writing comprehensive plans about whether it makes sense to be so specific in the plan or to leave, as you mentioned, Brett, I mean, like the plan, or maybe you didn't mention this somebody, but like the plan is a guiding document, but it has to have obviously written into its structure some flexibility to adapt. And I mean, we're, we currently refer to a plan that's 14 years old. So, uh, you know, I, I think in order to future proof it, you don't want to be too hemmed in, but yeah. You, that's a, okay. That's so maybe neither. That's like a, I didn't answer your question. Very no, clearly. no, I think that's helpful, but I, th I think we're on the same page. We, we envision that that is I don't know. We we hadn't concluded that we would necessarily yet concluded that we would try to build those targets into the plan. But but to Oliver and Stacey's point, we were definitely starting to talk about that from an educational perspective. So yeah, so say say pick a number. Say if you want to reduce vehicle miles traveled by fifty percent, what if fifty percent of those eighty six thousand people were not driving into the city? What does that look like from a housing perspective in the city? Um, once you consider families and the like. And so um, so I think it sounds like we're al aligned. That's definitely part of how we're going to start analyzing it. And then when we get into that, we might find that we want to develop some targets, but at a minimum, I think we're definitely aligned that we see that as an opportunity to explore some scenarios as to how different land use plans might manifest. 
Yeah. Uh, not to inter- interrupt this back and forth, uh, Commissioner Mills has been trying to join oh. the meeting by raising her hand, but I don't think you can see Mr. Leonard because you're not the host. And then I will defer and then ask my question after we get her in. Thank you, Commissioner White. Thank, thank you. Um, welcome, Commissioner Mills. Um, and uh, Commissioner Abrams, just as a quick, and we're going to pivot over to Washington. I know you have a collection of other thoughts, but um, it'll be a good opportunity for them to, I think, talk with uh, specialists that uh, are looking at demographics, fertility, mortality, migration. Now, we, we can't be prescriptive of market conditions, right? I think migration has a big question mark on it as far as what does it look like in the remote work era of and that hybrid work era? But uh, talking to folks about, you know, and, and the census gives us a pretty good guideline, right? 5,200 households over the next three years, 2.4 people per household. So what does that mean as far as like housing demand? Um, and then there's going to be developers that basically are tracking this, you know, consistently. So I think talking with specialists, getting a good understanding uh, of kind of like what are the housing demands. Again, the master plan uh, or the comprehensive plan to me is not necessarily to be prescriptive of those markets, but it should be reflective and understanding of those types of background, uh, again, statistical uh, and quantitative understanding of population. And then we should have a discussion about what does Ann Arbor want to be 20, 30, 50 years, you know, and what do we want to be when we grow up kind of a deal. So I think definitely a worthwhile conversation. Uh, not I, To me, it's not in, within the, the scope of the purview of the, the comp plan to prescribe, but um, definitely a, a great point. And with that, um, Commissioner Weiss, you've been very patient. <laughs> All you. No problem. Um, I think the things that are resonating to me, which I think is very germane to the conversation that we're having right now is there is a big educational lift that needs to happen um, because what most people are experiencing is inside their maybe 15 to 25 foot radius inside their neighborhood that I, I bought a house in this neighborhood with this kind of expectation. I didn't know that I was signing up for higher density. What does that mean for the, the reason why I purchased this house at this time in this location. So how much of that is done in the document? How much is that done just by the city as a educational series, just to help people understand that housing's not fixed, that when you buy a home, you don't get veto power over who your neighbors are, Um, But a lot of us have those sort of emotional conversations and they spill out at the at the planning table. So people will come and say, I bought this house in this location with this expectation. You are now changing that. And I don't have a say. And it's not that they don't have a say. It's that they're having a say with a larger group of people than the people they bought the house with. That, that group of people was the seller, them, and their realtors in the exchange. But now they're having a conversation with a city, a city that has a goal, the goals which are expansive and ever-changing and are influenced by who are seated in the political seats at the table. So how do we communicate all of that um, without making the comprehensive plan a um, a graduate level uh, seminar or or paper that they would have to read in order to understand, right? So I think that's at top of mind. When I joined Mr. Leonard and the planning staff at the Green Fair, I talked to neighbors and I was like, "Hey, what what's on your mind?" And they're just like, "We don't want our neighborhood to change." And and I was like, "Tell me more." Um, because those conversations are often tied to something, right? There's some fear, some anxiety that they need to externalize and that they need to know that someone cares about and is willing to do something about. So again, I, I don't know how much of that is our, is the responsibility of the comprehensive planning document. And then the other thing that's at top of mind is I've been watching the processes of other municipalities in Michigan who are adopting 
uh, their comprehensive plans, uh, in particular, uh, Royal Oak and Traverse City. And those conversations are very interesting. They are often very emotional. Um, there are some really challenging things that are shared. Like I've been here for five or six generations. I worked really hard to get here. Whoever wants to come, they're going to have to work really hard to get it. One member said, you can have my house when I die. Um, and, and, and that was like really surprising <laughs> to me. Um, other neighbors and other municipalities were saying things like when we put more density in, who wants to live in small unit housing? The only people who live in small unit housing are people who are related to crime. So they had already vilified the housing type to mm -hmm. say that that could only be used by someone who was participating in illegal activity. And, and that was, it was really challenging. I, I was watching this at 2X speed. So just going as fast as I could to get through that. And I would have gone at 3X if the playback could have allowed it. But um, I would love to avoid um, the, those conversations on the front end as much as we can. And I think we can do that by helping people see that we're on the same page, trying to solve a shared um, dilemma, which is that people wanna live in Ann Arbor and we are constrained by land. And so we have to do some things, which means this, 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 or that. And, and that's the direction that we're going in uh, as a community, uh, not in a, in a more restrictive um, direction. So those are the things that are in top of mind. And then the very last thing is when I saw your timeline, you only had two lines for the youth and they seem to only be in the center of your timeline of activities. And so I didn't wanna read too much into those lines in the event that you didn't intend to say anything with the lines and that the lines are just decorative, not uh, descriptive of how the youth are gonna be involved. Because I think if we're building a comprehensive plan for 2040, we have to have the people who are going to be graduating from high school and college at the conversation because we're talking about the community that they're going to inherit. I'm going to be comfortably in retirement. Um, I'm I'm not going to be the person who is impacted by, thank you, Mr. Leonard. <laughs> I'm not going to be the person impacted as much by this plan, but my, my kids will be. And I want to make sure that we're building a plan that if they choose to live in the city, that there are opportunities for them to live in the city. Yes, thank you for that. And yes, that graphic was an illustrative um, graphic and not like, you know, real in the sense that every single line had, you know, <laughs> I mean, we could have gotten to that level of detail, but it's not. Um, one of the things that we are discussing with Brett is specifically how we want to engage youth. And so that's an ongoing conversation. And in the more detailed community engagement plan that Oliver was talking about, you know, that is one thing that will still be fleshed out. It is a living document, so but it is it is um something we are thinking about. Uh, just... And the educational piece, yes. That's very important to us. Um, and we are already talking about it and trying to like figure out like how do we want to approach these very difficult topics. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, we will have similar emotionally challenging conversations, I, I, but we are, um, I'm in complete agreement and to, to echo where, what Stacey was just talking about, we've talked about that. And part of that is starting that early. It is starting that at the outset because yeah, we have to, we have to set the stage about why, why this, why we've been given this direction. For all those reasons that you articulated, we're a built out city, um, we have limited opportunity. And if we want to tip the scale on some of these in a more positive direction, we only have so many, few, oh, so, only so many tools are available to us. So, um, but I, um, but I, I, I don't sit here in front of you have done, having done multiple master plans or comprehensive plans myself. But the one thing I know is that they are, they are really challenging because for all those reasons that people um, they bring whatever scale experience that they have to it. And, um, and as we talked about in the context of home ownership, we as a society put so much wealth building into home ownership 
that it's particularly scary. It's particularly scary. Even, even um, thoughtful incremental change can be scary to that paradigm because we are so built as a society on, on that. And so um, I think there will be hard conversations, but education will be part of the plan process because it will have to be in order for us to find the right methods that we can successfully integrate those ideas. Thank, thank you. I'll just to add one quick note too. I think you know the value piece is really essential to that whole conversation too, right? I mean, we need to, you know, through our edu through the education side of the engagement process, you know, it's also an opportunity to kind of come together and confirm, you know, what are the shared values for the process that we're going to act on, because that's what we can go back to and said, hey, like we all agreed that these are the things that are important to us. You know, if we don't do something, here's the risk of not being able to meet, live up to our values and achieve what we say that we want to. So here are the couple of options that we have in front of us for how to better meet those in the future. And, um, you know, I think it's it's always tough, right? But like not doing anything isn't really a, a valid choice. And so we have to be able to also lay out, you know, some of the reasoning for that and share the data and the information um, that lays a foundation for that too. So, absolutely. So, um, Commissioner Weich, to try to um, summarize kind of your points is uh, the value of accessibility. The plan should be understandable. It should be accessible to folks of all um, strata, as well as again having this uh, element of being able to talk and explain uh, and, and understand people's stories. Um, as well as uh, best practices and comparable municipalities, uh, looking at their processes, and then also uh, making sure to engage the youth, um, the correlation with civic engagement, self-efficacy, and having the youth be a part is uh, pretty important. So I'm, I'm with you on all of those points. So thank you for sharing. Council Member Dish, thank you for being patient. I will unmute. Okay, I just wanted to highlight something that I thought was um, that Ellie said that I thought was really helpful. I feel like tonight is my night for first names. So I'm just not trying to address everyone as commissioner this and that. So um, I, I think that what I wrote down from what you said was that um, raising the question of it, not just setting targets for building market rate housing, but the the planning process would be an education in the idea that both building housing at X AMI and building market rate housing are strategies to increase affordability. Because right now that's not the way the community experiences it or sees it. And so I am hoping um, and this was a, I think this was a distinction implicit or explicit in Donnell's comments as well, that we can talk about the planning process as educational. So there's education that can go on in the process by virtue of the questions that are framed and the way they are framed. So, uh, you know, so that was a really great framing of how much of this and how much of that do we need to do to achieve affordability. Um, and then I'm hoping my my dream for the document is that it itself is educational. It helps us with messaging around certain things. And some of the messaging that would be really helpful would be exactly that. Um, when the city builds market rate housing, there is this much or there has been this much put into the millage, but that's not the only way that that's supporting affordability. It's also supporting affordability because it's increasing supply and it's causing some of the things that were built because we started to build in a little bit after 2000. So it's causing some of the things that were built after 2000 to become less expensive. I mean, they are not just because they are aging, but because more updated housing is coming into the market. And that is one of the ways you get affordability is you, by comparison, 15 years ago, luxury, years ago's luxury housing is perfectly decent housing, but it's cheaper. And people don't understand that. Somebody got mad at me like a week ago because I was trying to explain that. And they just got mad at me. 
And so it's okay because I understand that I'm an educator. So, and I get in conversations where people are educating me and I'm like, no, but I think that we, that is, you know, these conversations, I mean, so I don't take that as a bad thing, but it was really hard to explain. And I am not a pro at messaging around housing. And so it would be so helpful if one of the, if the document itself through, I don't know, pictures and simple words were mm -hmm. able to make points about how you reach affordability, were able to make points about density and changes and historical perspective. I'm sure that when my house was built, the people who lived in that neighborhood said, oh no, they're taking down the apple orchards. This is terrible. All of the apples are going to be grown out in the townships and whatever, and mm -hmm. they're not going to be in Ann Arbor anymore. And so the same feelings of loss and pain have been experienced all the way along as Ann Arbor has changed. But if when Ann Arbor stops changing, we will cease to be relevant and we won't be an economic engine anymore. And so I think that if the plan itself, the document itself can help to convey some of these messages, um, that would be my dream for it. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say thank you. That is a um, very helpful directive and I think is very much in line with the way we think um, in terms of messaging and storytelling and, and being able to get at these complex issues in a way that's understandable to everyone. And so we will be, and we have been thinking about how to explain um, these very things you've just mentioned, and you know, in in some sort of graphic storytelling way, um, that can get get at some of these key points. Like cartoons, maybe. Like cartoons. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Thanks. Um, so I agree with that. I think that's a really good idea. These plans can be really dense, and I think making it easily understandable and using it as an education tool is great. I also wanted to plus one um, Commissioner Abrams comments about having targets because I think we do I'm sh this is also my first comprehensive planning process I've been through as a commissioner although I, I heard about them in planning school the implementation of these plans like we need to I'm sure you guys are on this but I'm just thinking like understanding like where do we need to be like what's our five year 10 year 15 year because we do have all of these really aggressive, goals for housing and sustainability um that this this kind of leads into one of the other questions you had about i can't remember how you phrased it but sort of like pain points or like what, what might be difficult and i really do think that this like there there's there's a lot of people that are like housing all housing more housing tons of housing and then which is great we need all that and then there's people that are like okay, but it has to be all electric. Don't, don't approve this housing because it's not all electric. It's not as sustainable as possible. So there's really just this, like, where is our, like, how do we, what's the compromise? Like, what's the give here? Um, so just sort of like having, like, like, what can we do in those realms? Like, what is feasible? Like, how much housing should we build? Like, what percentage of it should we be targeting? I mean, like, should we trying to be put, you know, like there's just these things that I don't know how to articulate them clearly, um, but understanding sort of like where the community is at with that, I think would be really helpful. And then having like those targets for like, we should aim to build X thousand housing units in the next five years and here are the areas that are best suited for them. I think would be really helpful as we look towards like how to actually do this. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of rambling, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I think that that is, yes, we, we will be providing um, an implementation portion of the plan where we'll, we will be talking about, I don't, and I don't think necessarily it'll be targets, but it will be expressed through the zoning recommendations of where those increases can be after the analysis. And, and the public conversation, yeah. 
Yeah, and not to, I don't want to nerd out too much on the zoning, kind of technical zoning side of it, but I'm probably in good company for that. But, um, you know, I think, you know, that's where, you know, a lot of that sort of iterative process of looking at different scenarios and options comes through, right? And it's sort of exploring, you know, what if, so, you know, what if, you know, these residential districts are all simplified and organized in some way and, you know, any given parcel has the potential to have more units on it, you know, at an appropriate scale or size, you know, what might that mean for that entire district or zone citywide in the future? What what capacity might be in there for growth, right? It's not to say that we're going to have that capacity everywhere, but we want to understand sort of what that difference is that we're, that we're creating and being able to kind of model those ranges and sort of understand those things. Um, and then, you know, we do need to bring it back into reality, as Stacy said, and kind of align align those explorations with specific zoning recommendations. Um, you know, that'll be outside of just the stuff that's been recently rezoned to transit center. It's going to be looking at, you know, comprehensively across the whole city at, you know, where those changes can and should happen. So. I love that capacity for growth. I really like that. Thank you. Um, Council Member Dish. Oh. Okay, gotcha. Um, I'm happy to uh, try to recap at least what I've been hearing so far. Um, I, I wanted to make one point for, for me is the, um, I, I think I said the word accessibility earlier. Um, one of the things that we were the keynote speaker over at the Michigan Planning Conference talked about was um, zoning should be easy, uh, our zoning ordinance should be an, easy to understand. It should be at like a high school degree level. Um, if you want to do something in your house, you should be able to, um, you should be able to figure it out. And so I think the challenge is for our deliverable, right? We are consolidating eight elements and frameworks and we're collapsing it into one. So the simplification without losing the core kind of salience of each element is really important. So I, I think to me, it's, it's, it, how can you simplify so that it's easily digestible, understandable? Simultaneously, how do we balance all eight of those frameworks without losing kind of the spirit of them? So I think that's gonna be a big challenge for, you know, as, as we go through the actual deliverable, of, uh, you know, drafting this document. Um, and to uh, the question, I, I suppose, what happens to those elements? Uh, are they archived? And basically overwritten in essence by this one document. That that that's that's um just from like a deliverable standpoint. Uh, yeah, they're they're replaced. So they go into um oh I love to say this. Their their plans are gonna go sit on a shelf. <laughs> gotcha. Well, um, you know, and the continued uh you know reference to this um this document will continue to give it life. Uh, for me, it's it's distilling and and being able to consolidate those and making it very. I, I love the cartoons. Honestly, they were just um, brought me back and that level of engagement and and you know I, I think a lot of these values of access, education, equity, like they, they kind of have these resonant themes and, and it'll be a real challenge I think for us to say, you know we've had I don't know how many hundred pages are in these eight elements <laughs> and how um and what are we condensing it down to that that to me is that you know writing a single page paper is much harder than writing like a 20 page paper <laughs> so so to me it's it, that that's going to be our challenge how do we simplify without losing uh, the the complexity and the gravity uh, of the engagement that went into all of these elements and now how do we really bring and, and tease those out so to me actually one of the elements that we're missing in that timeline and one of these processes is really understanding each of these existing eight elements. I mean, we refer to them when we're reviewing site plans and things of that nature, but like a comprehensive, exhaustive review <laughs> of what we have right now. And then, uh, it's, I don't know if that's necessarily <laughs> a threat. You're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, uh, well, I'd, I'd, like, uh, yeah. I'd like to say, uh, well, I'd, I'd like to clarify where I'm coming from and what I've communicated to the team. I think this is an important clarity. This endeavor is not an audit of our past planning documents. For many of the reasons that we've talked about here, those documents um, have been in place for a very long time and they've built um, an incredibly successful community. 
They've been built on a lot of community engagement and they've brought us to this point. And so when you look into those plans, as far as the notion of understanding what those plans are, my challenge to you is a bit of no, you don't need to understand what's in those. We are in 2023 and 2024, and this is the time where we want to identify what are the challenges and risks for our community in the future. And what do we want to do about those? What are the, you know, maybe what are, and with that, there might be some things that frankly, we include in the plan that we're not sure what to do with. Like these are trends that eh, flying cars might be coming, but it's not right away. So what are we going to do about it? But I, I want to be clear that I, part of this work scope is not spending a lot of time auditing what was successfully accomplished out of those plans and what was not. It is very much starting a conversation, conducting a conversation, and um, summarizing that conversation into a set of values and ultimately a map and ultimately that implementation strategies that says, based on this snapshot in time and the voices that we have brought to the table, this is where we want to get to and these are the steps that we want to, we want to do that. Now, that, do, that means that there's a lot of burden on this process to make sure that it still speaks to uh, somebody talk, uh, I think Commissioner Clark was talking about being, or Commissioner Dish was talking about being stewards of the assets and resources that we have. And it means, as Commissioner Clark was talking about, what does that mean for resiliency across our community? And we're going to have to find the recommendations in that. But I, I want to, I do want to be clear just for the whole commission and anybody watching, this is not, and that's not any disrespect to the copious amounts of community engagement and work that went into those plans. Again, those have brought us to where we are, an incredibly successful community. And we're going to start now to have that conversation again about what's the next chapter in this. So um, so I, I just want to be clear on that. You were, Commissioner Lee, you were sort of venturing into some different areas than my approach. And I just wanted to set that stage um, to see if the other commissioners have concerns about that, if you have additional concerns about that, because that's a big part of this work is just a new comprehensive plan that is going to replace, not, ev not evolve, it's going to replace not all of those eight documents, but five of them. Un understood. I, I think that's a really good point that you make. Um, that being said, and maybe I'm the only dork here that read all of the plans <laughs> in preparation to this. It took a long time. So no, certainly I'm not suggesting yeah. anybody audit those. It takes a okay. very long time to sit there and read it. But um, I mean, if the, uh, so uh, can you clarify that point real quick about five as opposed to eight? So like yeah. the parks recreation open space plan that's going to stand on its own separately? So yeah, yeah. No, thanks for the question. So the parks and recreation and open space plan was adopted in 2021. And that really is um, although it's part of our comprehensive plan, it's a, it's a largely an asset management document for our park system. Um, and it's, it's recent. It's been adopted by both you and the city council. I don't frankly think it's worth a lot of our energies and efforts. Uh, the tree line trail, urban, the Allen Creek tree line, urban tree line trail, also a relatively recent document and pretty concise in its uh, in its application to a, as a very specific geography. Again, a very recent uh, um, plan and a lot of land use decisions can happen around that. I don't think that plan is really transformative to the options that it's going to face the planning commission and the community going forward. And then lastly, the transportation plan. Uh, the moving together towards Vision Zero was also a recently adopted plan, but I want to put a little caveat on that, um, that I don't see that plan being replaced or modified, but I see opportunities in that plan for us to go deeper or us to jump, find points to jump off. We've um, had some conversations about a little district called TC1 um, that I think is a example of sort of a nexus between some transportation planning ideas and some land use I, uh, uh, planning ideas. And so again, don't anticipate that plan going away at all, but I could see some um, ideas that originate in that plan that we identify that we'd like to explore further as part of this comprehensive plan. Okay. 
So those, so that's when I'm talking of the eight plans, those three are not being proposed for change. The plans that are, are our natural features plan, our land use plan, our state street corridor plan, our downtown plan, and our 2013 sustainability framework. Okay. Gotcha. Understood. Um, th thank you for that clarification. T to me, it is important to kind of understand, uh, you know, hey, what is the work, what has been the work? You're right that it's equally as important to just be facing, you know, say, hey, let's refresh. What are our values? Um, again, I, I continue to think that it is important for us to review what has been done. But that being said, um, I think the clarification is, well, wildly helpful for me to know. It's, it's actually five of the eight plants that's being replaced in that yeah. book. So. And a lot has been done. That's, uh, you know, just when you look at those plans, that has built the foundation of where we are now. A lot of the ordinances you see, a lot of the zoning districts you see, a lot of our natural features protections you see, a lot of our, some of our transportation decisions as well. So um, I encourage you to see those as evidence about the value and importance of this plan going forward and how it is going to have impacts on the community in the years ahead. Got it. Thank you. And Commissioner Mills. Sorry to join late. This follows on to that, and then I'll talk more. Um, is the intention that those plans, when not part of the tome of the original, but that we would also drop them out of other resource documents and move some of the other things that are in other resource documents farther back on the shelf? I'm just curious, because there's going to be a lot of conflict, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, I have not, it's a good question. In my head, I probably envision sort of a, almost wiping the slate clean of resource documents. But I think that's that, smart. That'll be part of the decision that comes to you. I, I think for the reason you said, I think there's a lot of value in those documents. Um, but they range from uh, old to um, things that we're talking about here that we want to actually update as part of this comprehensive plan process. So um, honestly, I haven't I haven't declared that in the scope or any anything um, definitively. But at this point, from a staff perspective, I would envision ultimately when this plan comes to you for adoption, it comes with a recommendation to wipe that slate clean or largely clean. Um, maybe we even, if we, if we're not, if there are resources there that we think are important, we might just flat out reference them in the updated plan. I, I'm supportive of that. I mean, like I was involved in a couple of these and I know that there was lots of work, but I think we have evolved and I think that's important. So I'm supportive of wiping things clean. Um, and sorry, I missed the presentation. I have to say, like, it, I was able to walk through it. I'm sure that the text behind it was even better, but it's, I'm really excited about this. And I, in particular, I think that the slides that we're talking about how we weigh, like, how we have to make trade offs, we just can't. I, I just came from a presentation saying you can't have everything um, or you make it impossible. And I think that the visual, though, I think is really striking. And I encourage that. Uh, or like, I think that that, that kind of thing is going to be really helpful. I don't, I'm interested to see what happens because I do think to commissioner who made this point, maybe it was commissioner dish. Um, some people have their thing and other people have their thing. And how do like, um, how, what are the shared, like, what is the shared balance of these things or, Geograph. I don't know. I don't know how you do that, but I'm excited to see what you come up with. Um, I, just one point to that, Mr. Mills. I don't. I don't think it'll be perfect by any stretch. But that was always sort of an intention that I think I talked. I think the Planning Commission talked about this um, when we first started looking at undertaking this work. Is that's why that values framework was really important. It's not necessarily going to. It's not frankly going to always reach consensus on those trade-offs but it's going to i like it's i like the notion of having a set of values that we can use as a as a problem solving matrix how how is this going to affect these values that we hold very in high regard and 
it's conceivable we could get to some prioritization of those values in some ways. But um, so in any event, I absolutely agree. And but that was that's part of the intention generally of a values framework before you get to the strategies and goals of the plan more specifically to say, to give you that ability to say, hold on, obviously that we have multi, there's hundred perspectives on this from the 50 people in the room. How it does, let's go back to these things that are important to us. What would this mean to affordability? What would this mean to sustainability? What would this mean to equity? And to Commissioner Weich's point, hopefully that'll help us process some of some difficult conversations. Yeah. The other thing that is going through my mind in terms of difficult conversations or more like thinking about creativity, like how we get at this, I 100% agree that youth engagement is important. <laughs> I also know that like what I valued about my hometown or my decision about going back is different, right? Like that I don't know that as a seven-year-old, like my kids have lots of strong opinions about this city and what makes it great. Like, um, but, but I'm just, what I'm thinking about is like how, how we get at the, the essence, <laughs> right. Of like, maybe it is the recent comers back or the people who are working with a realtor and cannot find anything that they can afford, but what it is that they, that, that draws people to this place. Like, and I, and, and at the same time, and maybe this is pulling in things from work too much. There was, as an example, there was a discussion about, um, a coal plant closure community didn't have time to grieve that coal plant closure. They had like a funeral for this. Like, what is it that people are grieving? Like, what do they feel like is lost? And I think that that's, I, I don't know, like, this is where the conversations I think are going to be full of feelings. Um, but I, I, I think that there might be, it might help us actually get to the point of like, okay, what are some, what are, where are the nuggets of the things that make make this place special? I don't know. I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I, yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about the steering committee at the conference of plan committee meeting, I, I, uh, subcommittee meeting. And so I just want to share that as part of the extension of the steering committee was specifically trying to outreach to some younger demographics. And so um, I haven't, we've greatly increased our applicant pool. All, some of a lot of you planning commissioners I think have helped with that. We're over 80 now, which is terrific. Um, uh, but I, I just do want to point out that I've, I specifically sent it out to the five high schools in town. Um, I, I think we've talked about this a lot. Youth engagement is going to be really important throughout the process. I agree at different age groups, there's probably going to be different conversations about it. And that's a challenge that um, we brought up with the consultant team, frankly, at both the interviews and subsequent to that, 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 that needs to be a successful endeavor that needs to be a successful component of our community engagement is hearing from a wide variety of youth voices so that that is part of the decision-making process. Cause I completely agree. You know, my kids, it's going to matter more to my kids than it's going to matter to me in a lot of ways. Thank you. Do we have any other thoughts? And if we actually wanted to bring up the list of questions just to prompt people, but in the meantime, Commissioner Abrams. I mean, I have a few more thoughts, but I also want to make space for people who have not yet had a chance to speak. So I'm happy to pause for a minute, but I just maybe want to be on deck if if other people are gathering their thoughts. Thank you. Do you want me to share the the questions one more time in this, yeah. in this pause? Yes, I think that'd be helpful just to prompt folks. I'd love to pose two questions, just if it resonates with any commissioners. One is this question about economic diversification. I think we talked about diversification. I was hearing 
I was hearing that when we were talking earlier about who has access to live and work in our community. Another way to think about this is literally old school, uh, nerdy planner, old school economic diversification. What do our industries look like? What does our business community look like? Is it varied? Um, and then a big part of the carbon neutrality plan and something we've talked about a bit at the table um, is integrating a variety of land uses and prior previously all residential areas. Um, I wonder, those are, those are sort of two questions that I wonder if there's any particular thoughts top of mind on any commissioners on those two components. Commissioner Weatherby. So one thing that I kind of, I think it ties back to a lot of other comments related to that is one of the things, and when I was working on R4C um, zoning, it came up a lot is people didn't want changes to the R4 zoning because what they wanted was, um, you know, the old west side. They wanted the existing R4 zone R4C zoned areas to stay like they were with the old storefronts, with the close in houses, with the not realizing that the R4C zoning was absolutely designed to get rid of all that. And that that actually changing R4C zoning was more likely to get people back to the form that they wanted than it was to to actually change everything. And so I think when you talk about that of like, you know, storefront, like integrated storefronts. I mean, I live across from a jewelry antique store and there's, you know, a pop-up store down the street. And, and those are things people really like, but when you talk about changing zoning or changing the ability for a new business to move in, you know, at one point, the jewelry store across the street from me was a liquor tattoo store. And, you know, how to how to make it so that that doesn't feel scary because people, businesses come and go, norms come and go, and, and trying to, trying to help people understand that, to Commissioner Weish's point, you don't get to have necessarily 100% say around or any say around, you know, if we say there's going to be a, it's okay to have a business, then that business might not be the business you would choose, but it's legitimately there. Um, but, but that's just one thing of, I think, more education around those of like, if, if you can, and, and that, I guess that education goes both ways like um beer camp was another one that you know beer camp really that was a hard fight to get beer camp to be where it is or it was a it it, it wasn't exactly what everybody was thinking should go there at the time um people love it now but if another store was to come in to take over people might not like it so so I, I guess I don't know where which way I fall. I think the education is important because you need to give give neighborhoods the opportunities that people do like, but with those opportunities also come things that people might not like. And so kind of addressing the fears and the opportunities within the same. So I guess that's that's my thought. Cause it's just something that came up a lot in the R4C was like we don't want to make any changes. We want the ability to go back to what it used to be. And it's like, well, that's going to require changes. And, and people didn't really quite understand that. I'm thinking, uh, again, more of a note for me and the project team, those blog posts might be an opportunity, Oliver, for us to explore some of these issues. Um, that might yeah. be a good opportunity to use those as some places where we can start putting together a narrative about businesses and residential areas or housing typologies. Um, those might be some good opportunities to start 
building yeah. out some of those. And then we can take those things to a lot of different engagement opportunities and probably refine them and improve them over time as well. Yeah. And shape them as graphics and infographics and other things that are more digestible to the yeah. you know, discussion around education and kind of accessibility of the plan. You know, I, th I think there's so many of those little things. I mean, you know, full disclosure, I grew up in town here. I still live here. I've never managed to leave. So anyway, I have lots of family and friends here and it's amazing, you know, how many, you know, people have, you know, bought a house here 20 years ago that are like, you know, they're really worried that like, you know, a high rise is coming in right next to their house. Right. And I don't think there's a lot of chances for places where that ne is necessarily going to happen. And I don't think, you know, I think people hear about density and they hear about density in a single family neighborhood and they're, they immediately go to the extreme of what that means. Um, and, you know, so starting to use blog posts and other communication tools to be more deliberate as the plan moves forward and we start to have a sense for what that means and being able to show it visually, graphically, through presentation form, you know, different formats, you know, what that means to help address people's concerns and fears and say, you know, no, it's not this. When you hear, you know, we're talking about this thing over here. So anyway, a lot, a lot there to unpack. Yeah, and specifically like this this question about storefronts and you know uh, people wanting certain control and obviously that's not how it works. I mean, we have Bobby on the team um, from And Access who is very immersed in that world and will be able to help to create some of that educational uh, material. Yeah, uh, just chiming in here, it's you know I think it's uh, how does retail real estate work you know on like per elemental level of you know hey this is what's required from a financing standpoint this is how leasing operates this is you know how often we we're actually in interviews earlier today like how many tenants you actually have to talk to before you can sign one lease right it's, it's very much so a, a long tenuous process and so being able to fully articulate some of those things like Oliver is saying through infographics um, in ways that are digestible I think will be a beneficial exercise as we get through this process um, and then I know one additional thing that we were talking about is just you know looking at what is you know supportable square footage for total population right of of the city just based upon you know expenditure data and and some you know what brands are doing from a sales basis and then just having some like pure simple numbers that just talks about it takes this many people you know to support one store and so you know when we're talking about this is in in a neighborhood context all right well can how many stores can we support and this is not even counting the specific categories and the fragmentation of that demand thank, thank you i think those are all really good insights about you know, what, what makes how difficult it can be to have economic development so uh commissioner white i just wanted to um echo the, what I think I heard Mr. Leonard say around the new comp plan replacing the collection of documents that have made up our existing plan, that this is not, a, we're not trying to redeem or redeem is the wrong word. Um, anyway, someone will put the right word in uh, those um, those plans, but this is this is a new articulation of what we want to do with our land use and with our zoning. And then to that end, um, I wanted to go back to the slides. I think it was specifics from the resolution around the reduction of um, zoning districts, because I think a huge part, oh, you didn't have to bring it up. Sorry, I was okay. just referencing it. <laughs> um, the um, Just the the notion that uh, one of our out, our goals, our stated goals is to reduce the maybe even the size of our universe, you know, our UDC as a result of our comp plan, because we will have maybe less zoning designations and therefore less tables and then less, you know, charts and so forth to explain how those zonings uh, work. And I, and I, that would be a fantastic thing uh, to blog about and especially blog about how other municipalities have done that. So like Minneapolis, just went to a residential zoning 
designation as opposed to R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, which are R6 residential zonings, and then how light, lot sizes sort of change through all of that. And then we have to have that table, but it's a new residential zoning with this kind of minimum lot size with these kinds of setbacks, um, which then allows us to achieve our goals. So I just, I'm excited, uh, as uh, Commissioner Mill said, about uh, what you already have as what I would consider your non-negotiables, which are the specifics from the resolution. So we are building on top of what the um, legislative body has said they'd like to see, as opposed to we're going to debate these. So these are already stated, they're our baseline. And now if this is our baseline, how then do we build out our city for the next 15 to 20 years? And, and that is um, just really, really exciting uh, to me. Thank you. Do we have any other comments, thoughts, top of mind items? Um, Commissioner Abrams, thank you. All right, I'll just get them out here. I think it's relative to the conversation we're having. Um, I just was thinking, uh, personally, I'd be really interested in thinking about allowing commercial use in residential neighborhoods, but it leads me to think about two other things. One is um, just like how we how, how you think about future proofing, or you can't prove it, but how you think about the longevity or, or durability or relevance of the comprehensive plan over some extended time period. And I guess I wonder about how kind of visionary, uh, I don't wanna use the word radical, but let's say visionary the plan can be versus rooted in the pragmatics of what is versus what can be. And so I think as a commission, you know, not, I won't speak for, all, not, not that we are, a, not that we all agree on this or that there's consensus, but, but at times people have put out ideas like, eradicating single family zoning or unzoning altogether or and I wonder um you don't have to answer this question but I think I'm I'll be curious as the process unfolds to learn more about how um you all will balance that and kind of know that you know it's a plan we might refer to for for a decade or more and so how we think about pl planning that kind of resilience I guess into the plan um and related to that I was thinking um, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and economic diversification and small scale commercial. And we've talked a little bit about affordability as something which we need to think about for the commercial and business community, as well as housing. Um, two things, one is that we we talk a lot about zoning, but I think we're also really aware that processes, processes of development and things like entitlements um, are another sticking point that make development in the city expensive. So I think in addition to zoning, those kinds of policy changes are something we need to be thinking about. And then also uh, just in terms of the community engagement portion, like how we engage people who don't live in Ann Arbor, who aren't already part of our community. I think this often comes up when we talk about engagement. So like, um, just maybe what what mechanisms we might have for reaching out and hearing from the people who wish they were who want to be part of this community but haven't found a way to afford to be able to join us. And then last, because I'm just rattling things off, I just wanted to say that although collaboration with the university might not be on the table, I think the university is a tremendous resource. And what I mean by that is that I think if there are, if you find yourselves as a team up against a limitation of, of what resources the city is able to provide um, or what the kind of contract is between Interface or Smith Group and the city, like I think there are, are resources at the university that would could contribute to this process in an interesting way. So whether that's faculty expertise or actually engaged learning opportunities for students to do kind of project-based learning. And so many of us on this commission have university affiliations and I'll volunteer myself to be somebody who I think would be happy to uh, act as some kind of liaison or at least try to convene the right people to, around a conversation if those kinds of opportunities seem like something that could be helpful in this process. 
I think that was all the things I wanted to say. Thank you. And also I'm really excited. Uh, so thanks for being here this evening. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Abrams. Do we have any other thoughts? And then just looking at time right now, we're at 9.02. So um, perhaps another 10 minutes at most. Um, and uh, just to reiterate kind of what I've heard so far, we've heard Commissioner Clark's resilience, Commissioner Weatherby, um, U of M integration and housing mix, uh, Council Member Dish with economic diversity across the city and, and key areas, as well as different mo models of ownership and supportive infrastructure. Um, uh, Commissioner Abrams, you just gave us a lot. <laughs> I was just trying to <laughs> encapsulate all of that. That was quite a lot. Um, but, but I do love um, hearing it. And also, it's great that we have three, I think, U of M professors right here with us <laughs> currently. Um, so that's always great to see. Um, my question about challenges for implementation is this, uh, the unified development code, when does it catch up? Cause like, what does that process look like? Cause this doesn't necessarily, you know, fix you to UDC, right? And so, um, what is the timing and mechanism by which these two things start to align? And so can I get some just feedback and discussion points? Cause I think that's going to be a, a pretty significant challenge for implementation. So yes. And no. Okay. Uh -huh. So at their most simple, they're sequential. The plan lays, lays out a clear uh, community-based implementation schedule that says these are the changes that you should do to achieve the vision that this plan lays out. And so that happens after that adoption. You're absolutely right. The plan doesn't change anything in the UDC but it gives us ideally a menu that says, this is the stuff you do in the first six months. This is the stuff we should do in the first year. This is the stuff we should do in the first three years. And it sets a fresh, uh, well-documented and community engagement, community conversation-based implementation schedule that is, I think has some momentum behind it um, uh, that, you might find actually a little bit more streamlined than some of our recent ordinance amendments, which are based on some older policy documents. Gotcha. No, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I think that uh, I, the excitement that people express is also incredibly important. Um, and just kind of getting back at uh, just th this should be a fun process. And I think that that'll help to um, improve engagement. So. Um, I, I think one of the questions that you had asked, um, Mr. Leonard, was, is economic diversification a goal? And you are, I, I did really kind of grapple with that. Is it location quotients? Is it sector diversification? Is it the strata of services? Um, it got me thinking about, you know, what are, what's our tech corridor? You know, the Liberty is kind of considered a tech corridor, or is there a designated research park? Are there innovation or opportunity zones? And can there be alignment with, you know, state level and federal level um, incentive programs? And so I, I thought, I grappled with that as economic diversification a goal. That's actually, I think, a, a question we haven't really answered as a group. Um, and to, to me, economic development is a key con critical component to having a healthy uh, you know, city. Um, and so this uh, discussion about should commercially, you know, uses be within residential. I mean, I technically, it seems like everyone here is zooming from, you know, some form of a residence. So I suppose we're all, you know, conducting some level of commerce to, so, uh, this is public service. I mean, I guess that doesn't technically count. But so the question really is, is economic diversification a goal? Do, do any other commissioners feel strongly about um, this being a component of our comp plan? Commissioner Mills. I am just going to pull one of the things that I learned about one of the 13 ways to kill your community is to not have competition. Um, and I think, I mean, I think that we are stronger, like to not put all of our eggs in a basket. And as we grow, we are going to need to diverse, like we're going to need the service sector to come along, lots of things to support that population. Right. And so I, I think that, I think it's a good goal. I don't know that it is the top priority, but I, like, I don't know that it it rises to the same level as the other three, but I, I think 
having, I mean, we are a company town. We will always be a company town, but previous, I, I, I moved in after the Pfizer stuff, but like the idea that, you know, like a, a large industry or a large employer otherwise can have huge impacts on us, I think is important to acknowledge. Agreed. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Um, do any other commissioners feel uh, a certain type of way about economic diversification being a potential goal within the comp plan? All I'll right. just quickly say, I think it should be a goal, but not the most important goal. I echo what I liked what Commissioner Mills said. Understood. Commissioner Clark. <clears throat> um, actually, I, I think it's a pretty big priority um, for a number of reasons. But um, yeah, just the idea of having our more diversified economy will benefit everybody, especially with different type range of housing. Um, we need a range of jobs for everybody and um, more services in the downtown area, especially with there are a lot of closure of businesses and everything. I think that um, even like the lack of downtown groceries, more population. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, thank, thank you. No, no worries. Um, Commissioner Weatherby. Yeah, I think it's important, but I also think we have to, and maybe this isn't a, but it's a, and we have to think about how our goals interact with that economic diversification. And one of the big ones, or small ones, but I think about it is um, Pizza Bob's. So that little triangle where Pizza Bob's and uh, and Mr. Spots and and we took away all their parking and put in a bike lane, and that very well could kill those businesses. They could thrive too, but we have to think about how how we interact and how moving forward, you know, when we had a lot of these plans, uh, things, you know, uh, there'll be drone deliveries. I mean, soon, like that's not a pie in the sky thing anymore. It's a drone in the sky, but it's a, um, it is a, <laughs> yeah. it, but you know, this is a, it's an actual thing that the university is going to be doing. Like, so, we have some needs and some interactions with how we deal with businesses, how we deal with residences, how we deal with transit that aren't always, um, don't always lift each other up. And that's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just thinking about how we, you know, I know there's a lot of people who don't want a bar across from them. Uh, we have like Dominic's closes at 10 because that's part of their thing that they have to close because they're in a residential area. So figuring out how these interactions and how how economic diversification and we we want a lot in in what we in our sort of limited space and how how all those things come together is not only with like the options that we have in residential, but also with businesses and, and how they interact. And, you know, I think we're, we're no longer talking about slaughterhouses, but there are other businesses with other, other advantages or disadvantages to the nearby residences or businesses. And, and I'm not sure our plans always think about like we think in a residential, we think in economic diversification, we think in business, but we don't always understand how they relate to each other. Cause sometimes we don't know until something is proposed. <laughs> um, so I guess that's just something I want to throw out there. When, when I think about this, I think about how they all interact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Weich. Yeah, just piggybacking um, maybe off of uh, <laughs> a little bit of what uh, Commissioner Weatherby uh, just articulated. I think when I think of this kind of economic uh, diversity and 
prioritization and our land use. I want to uh, enable what we see in our Carytown sort of district and market, right? That could that be rebuilt in another neighborhood? Currently, it cannot be. Um, we can't pick up what we have there and put it like in my subdivision here in Lawton um, because it's all zoned R1C and it it's not allowed. So, but then to hear what Commissioner Weatherby was just saying about how some of our other plans, like our A20 um, plan or our, um, sorry, not A20, our Vision Zero plan um, has a direct impact on sort of the economic viability of some businesses, uh, depending on where they're located, how those things come together. So, and then bringing all of that into play with something I think I heard uh, Bobby or Mr. Boone say earlier in the conversation around, um, we, we heard a lot this year about mixed use, um, especially like in the George. And um, fortunately we have you commissioner or chair Lee at the table to talk a little bit about the commercial viability of certain properties and how they're situated and how that goes or, or doesn't flow. But a lot of people don't understand the amount of density. I, let me say it this way. I did not understand the amount of density that was necessary to support a retail establishment in a residential area. And it was super helpful when the DDA came and said, uh, we went from 19,000 um, employees, daytime employees in the downtown district to uh, just under 10,000. And that that's having a demonstrative impact on the businesses because you don't have the foot traffic, just people going to lunch or grabbing breakfast or grabbing a coffee. And so that that is having an impact. Now, intersecting that with, oh, we want to put a hotel in the downtown area. And, and people are like, well, we don't want that there. But then how do we make our downtown viable and work if we are restricting the kinds of things that can attract? So it feels really complicated. <laughs> it's like, it, it feels like a network effect that this thing impacts yeah. this thing, that impacts this thing, that impacts that thing. And so then how do we paint that picture when we talk about um, economic diversity? Because we definitely don't want a single source of economic driving in our city to dry up and then create this sort of um, challenge um, towards the viability uh, and vitality of our city. So um, I think it's a priority. I, I liked what Commissioner Clock said. I think it's a priority. I think I agree with Commissioner Hammerschmidt that it's definitely something that should be on the radar, but I don't know that it is the primary goal. Um, but having said all of that, I feel like we definitely should keep it in the mix uh, to figure out how we enable it. And 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 the other thought I had was we did hear from residents around the marijuana distribution uh, when we changed the rule to match the state. So we went from retail to manufacturing, and I I might be getting the terms yeah, incorrect. Medical to retail. No, it was it was when we had to match the state and someone could be a distributor as well as a grower, as well as a retail, and they could all have it in the same space. We had a, a resident who came and said, I didn't get any feedback that this was going to abut my backyard when the retail came. And now you're changing the rule and allowing them to do something new and 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 you have the details mr leonard so i trust you um so that is something for us to consider is that that had a, a negative impact on that resident and we were we weren't like making a big change in our mind we were just saying we've got to match what the state has said that we have to do but for the resident it felt demonstratively different um, and, and I've heard about that with people with even like a Jefferson market in the neighborhood. They're like, where are the delivery trucks going to go? And do you want a refrigeration truck sitting in front of your house unloading? And I was like, yes, because then I don't have to drive 
out of my neighborhood to go to the grocery store, I can walk. And I'm happy to put it next to my house if you don't want it there, because it's less walking. Um, but but I am a constituent of one. Thank, thank you. Um, I appreciate the feedback. Um, so looking at the time, we're at 9.17. I wanted to check in with Interface um, and Smith. Do you guys feel like you got good feedback that's um, it's helpful? Is, are there any other items that you wanted to really cover uh, yet tonight? Uh, Ms. Chen, Stacy, looking at you. I think that this has been really great, um, really, really good topics um, and responses to our our issues and questions that we can start to frame out more and more um, our ideas around these themes and the education pieces. I think that's really like one of our primary early goals as we are gearing up um, is to get those those things underway. Got it. Thank you. And um, I'll just leave this that this we this we didn't really tackle the opportunity question, but I mean Ann Arbor is seen as a leader, <laughs> and um, being at the Michigan Planning Conference, uh, people are like, oh wow, Ann Arbor, you guys eliminated you know parking minimums. I'm like, we're not the first to do that, but uh, but um, I mean this is an opportunity to really demonstrate uh, you know let, let's have uh, consideration in a lot of different areas and, and really kind of push the boundaries. So. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate it. Kind of looking at, uh, so we'll, we'll move on to the next item. Um, is there anything to do with, uh, there's, I think the only other thing on the agenda is, um, I have, just to check real quick, public comment um, or communications. So uh, persons may speak for three minutes. Um, that's what we'll move on to, to speak in public comment, please call 206-337-9723. Uh, this is, as this is only broadcast via Zoom, not via uh -huh. TN, there's okay. um, anybody who's watching is already logged in. So okay. if anybody would like to address the uh, Planning Commission, you can use the raise hand feature and you'll have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. And there are none. All right. Well, then with that, I will move on to adjournment. So all in favor? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening. Have a good night.